In a prior video, I showed data on the average prognosis in relapsing onset multiple sclerosis, but today I'm going to talk about progressive multiple sclerosis and the average prognosis and factors like sex, use of disease modifying therapy, secondary versus primary progressive multiple sclerosis, the presence of relapses, how do these things affect the prognosis. Now I want to give a fair warning, the data are quite sobering, but there's a lot of variability. I definitely have patients with long-standing progressive MS who are older and do very well, so take the data with a grain of salt. Also, there's a bias for physicians to diagnose more disabled people with progressive multiple sclerosis. Now, I'm going to show data from two different scientific studies, and I'm going to refer to a disability scale called the EDSS, or Expanded Disability Status Scale, and this is a 0 to 10 scale uh, measuring disability in multiple sclerosis research studies. I have a separate video on it if you want to take a look, but very basically, 0 refers to no disability, 3 to 4 could be considered moderate moderate disability. At EDSS 6, a cane is required to walk 100 meters, and at DSS 7, a wheelchair is required. Let's get to the data. We'll start with data from the MS EPIC study at University of California, San Francisco, and I give credit to first author Dr. Bruce Cree for this excellent publication, link in the description below. And they just looked at people with progressive MS, 61 of them, both primary and secondary progressive MS, and looked at whether or not they got better, stayed the same, or got worse over a 10-year period. So so the people who got worse are in the dark shaded gray areas, and the people who got better stayed the same or in the light shaded gray areas. And they divided them into their baseline EDSS. So people with low disability, EDSS of 1.5, 2, or 2.5, they all got worse, which makes sense because they wouldn't really have a diagnosis of progressive MS if they stayed at low disability for a prolonged period of time. But people who had a greater amount of baseline disability, most of them got worse, but about 20 to 40 percent of them them stayed the same or got better. And there was a slight trend towards people with greater disability having a higher probability of getting worse. If you look at people with an EDSS greater than 4 or 4.5 or above, about 80% of them got worse, but that's over a 10-year period. Next, we'll move to the main event of the evening, which is data from a poster I saw at the American Academy of Neurology virtual meeting in 2021. And they had this registry from MS base with close to 10,000 people with progressive MS, about 4,400 had primary progressive MS and about 5,500 had secondary progressive MS. And it's interesting to look at the baseline characteristics. They divided them into primary and secondary progressive MS and they called them N, meaning no relapse activity, or A, meaning activity, or at least one superimposed relapse because many people with progressive MS also have relapses. So you can see primary progressive MS, the total group, PPMSN, meaning the group that had no relapses, and PPMSA, the group that did have activity, and the same thing for secondary progressive MS. And so you can look at these baseline characteristics. The percentage who are male is higher in primary progressive MS, 47%. Uh, so men are overrepresented in primary progressive MS, even though only one-fourth or one-third of people with MS are men. A much higher percentage have primary progressive MS. This is well known, whereas with secondary progressive MS, it was only about one-third men, 32%. In terms of the age of MS onset, it was much higher in primary progressive MS, 43.5 versus 32.3 for secondary progressive MS. And you can see the age of progressive onset is actually slightly higher in secondary progressive MS, 43.5, of course the same of MS onset because it's primary progressive versus 47 in secondary progressive MS. And you can also look at their disability and inclusion. So for primary progressive MS, they were a little bit less disabled at the start with a median EDSS of 4.0, moderate disability, versus in secondary progressive MS, it was 4.5. And you can look at the disability at the time of completion of the study. The median EDSS was 6, meaning a cane was required to walk 100 meters in both groups. And you can also look at the relapses. So obviously the PPMSN group had no relapses, but many people with primary progressive MS do have relapses. They had an annualized relapse rate or the average number of relapses per year of 0.26, which was on average one relapse per four years versus about 0.34 or one relapse on average per three years in secondary progressive MS. And they looked into the average age of onset for the different phenotypes and for men and women, and women got progressive MS at a slightly older age for primary progressive MS, 44.4 years on average versus 43 years for men, and for secondary progressive MS, 
47.3 years for women and 45.6 years for men. And if you look closely, you can also see there's a tendency for people with disease activity labeled A to be diagnosed with progressive MS slightly younger than people without relapses. And then they looked at the probability of disability progression with the different phenotypes. And they defined this depending on your baseline EDSS score. So if you had an EDSS of zero, in other words, no disability, you had to rise by at least 1.5 for it to be considered significant. And that's just because an EDSS1 is so minimal, it's hard to consider that disability progression. But if you had an EDSS of 1 to 5.5, you had to have a rise of at least one for it to be considered disability progression, for instance, to go from two to three or three to four. But once you got to an EDSS of six, you only had to have an increase in 0.5. And that's because at that level, each 0.5 makes a very significant difference. It's a very nonlinear scale. But anyways, you can see that primary progressive MS was a little bit worse. There was a little bit higher probability of having disability progression compared to the red line. And this is the hazard ratio relative to relapsing MS. So primary progressive MS on the average is a little bit more aggressive. When they broke it down into people with and without relapses, there was a tendency for people with relapses to do slightly better. So if you look at SPMSA, secondary progressive MS with activity or relapses, they actually had the best prognosis. And this is probably because they have more of an inflammatory MS and less of a degenerative MS, which is less associated with uh, irreversible disability. So in this bizarre way, relapses could actually be seen as a good thing. But when you look at the numbers, the differences between the groups weren't that large. For example, with secondary progressive MS, the hazard ratio for disability progression relative to primary progressive MS is 0.86. In other words, they only had a 14% lower risk of disability progression, not really a huge difference. Men are reported to have worse MS on average and have more disability on average average, but there wasn't really a huge difference. The hazard ratio was 1.17, meaning only a 17% increased risk of disability progression, and it was statistically significant, although this is a small difference, likely greatly outweighed by individual differences. Interestingly, the age of onset of progressive MS made no difference, and the EDSS of baseline was actually inversely related. In other words, if you had more disability, you were less likely to progress, but that's probably just because of the scale itself. Once you get to a higher EDSS of 6 or 6.5, it's not very sensitive to small changes. Now, there was an effect of disease-modifying therapy, but it was very small. For instance, the hazard ratio was 0.97 overall and 0.96 for immunosuppressants. Now, this was statistically significant because it's a huge sample size, but that's a very small effect, and that may have to do with the fact that, for one, certain disease-modifying therapies really don't have any clinical trials evidence for efficacy in progressive MS, so they really may have been used off-label and they may have just been ineffective, and there may be certain biases in terms of who gets medications and who doesn't. There was also a problem where people who had more frequent exams tended to have more progression. So in other words, when you're evaluated more frequently, we tend to pick up progression, potentially biasing the study. But when we look at the specific subtypes, there does seem to be something to the idea that specifically people with secondary progressive MS with activity, SPMSA, have a less progressive progressive MS on average with a hazard ratio of 0.78 or 22 percent less progression, and this is highly statistically significant. And next we'll move to a hard endpoint, which is the survival curve for reaching confirmed EDSS greater or equal to 7, in other words, requiring a wheelchair for longer distances. And this is sobering data, but the good thing is that younger people with progressive MS are relatively unlikely to require a wheelchair. You can see the risk is only about 12.5% at age 50, but then it jumps to around 25% by age 60, and by age 80, the risk is over 50%. And primary and secondary progressive MS are almost identical in the very long term in terms of this outcome. And even dividing it into the individual subtypes, there really aren't significant differences between primary and secondary progressive MS with or without activity 
earlier on, it seems that there's a tendency for people with activity, whether they have primary or secondary progressive MS, to have a little bit higher risk of requiring a wheelchair, which is sort of the reverse of the data I showed before. However, if you look at the end, you can see that there are very few data points for older people, so this data may not be very reliable. And also, there's a trend towards multiple sclerosis becoming a little bit more benign as time goes on. So if we look at the next 50 years, things may look very different, particularly with the introduction of highly efficacious disease-modifying therapies early on in the disease. But I'd be interested to know your thoughts. What do you think about this research? And do you have any suggestions for future videos?